What were some of the mistakes that you made in the early beginning, maybe as an, as an athlete or as an artist that you, in retrospect, say, hmm, I shouldn't have done that, but maybe because of that, something good came out of that. Yeah, I mean, mistakes, failures, you know, it's hard. It's, if you're looking back, I think some of the mistakes are related to like sh just being short-sighted or not, not thinking far enough out. I mean, just in high school with basketball, I was dead set on being a postman, like down low, back to the basket. Um, you know, so I never worked on my three pointers. Mm. I didn't really work a lot on, on dribbling skills or being a guard because I was a big man. Right mm. now, six, four in high school. Yeah. You're taller than most guys, but not for college. <laughs> I was, a, I would have been a point guard in college at six, four. And, and so if I really had aspirations of, of going and playing in college and beyond, like I should have been thinking, Hey, you know what? I'm going to work on my dribbling skills, my three pointers, mm -hmm. my ball handling, passing, all that kind of stuff so that I could put myself in a position that when I went to college, that I wasn't pigeonholed into being a big man. Cause that was the only mm. skill set I had. Hello, boys and girls. <laughs> my name is JJ Ruescas. Welcome to another episode of Optimizandome or Optimizing Me, the show where we interview very, very interesting and particular humans whose story, lessons, habits, and mindset are what we can extract and use in our own lives. Our guest today is a region director and virtual product director at Camp Gladiator here in Austin, Texas. He is the host of The Mindset Forge, a podcast that focuses on learning the lessons from successful athletes and performing artists. You know, people who show up in those big moments of performance, and he's a student of that. He has traveled the globe in ways that differ from a majority of people, and that's something I will talk about that today. The experiences acquired during those early years of his life are what shaped the athlete, artist, leader, father, and husband that he himself has transformed into now. I am very excited for our conversation today because we will interview the interviewer of what makes high performers tick. Without further ado, let me introduce you to Barton Bryan. Thank you so much, JJ. How are you doing today? Very good. Very good. Thank you for having me at your place, Martin. It's super nice to have you. Yeah, well, it's fun to do virtual record, you know, interviews because it's easy to talk to people from all over the world, which is great. But to sit down with somebody and truly break bread in my house, you know, is really special. So thanks for coming over. And I'm really excited about the next uh, hour. Thank so. you. Yeah. So let's go straight to the point. Who is Barton Bryan and what does it mean to be an athlete for you? In this case, let's start with athlete. So what does it mean to be an athlete is really about using your body as an instrument to achieve a goal. I think, I think when it comes down to, because there's so many different sports and there's so many different ways that we can use our body, whether it's fitness, whether it's a specific sport like swimming or gymnastics, CrossFit, whatever it is, like, we're training and fine tuning our bodies to be the best at something and to have a goal to be the best at that thing. And there's so many different types of sports. I mean, that could be, that could be so many different things and trained in so many different ways. But I think at the core of it, our body, our instrument to create, you know, this goal or this, this competition or this performance in a sport versus in like an artistic form. So I think the mm -hmm. difference that I really see, and we're going to talk about performance too, is instead of having an artistic endeavor, which would be more of a performer, it's an athletic endeavor, but there's so many of the same commonalities with our body is oftentimes our instrument. Hmm. And what does it in that sense mean to be an artist? or a performing artist in this case? What do you think? Well, I think there's that next level of communication and expression that is why people show up to watch an artist perform. And that comes down to like, I, 
as an artist, you understand something about life that's, that's common or uncommon, but you're sharing it with the audience. And that audience is going on a journey with you. And they're experiencing and they're actually f- potentially feeling or mm-hmm. connecting with that artist because of the expression. Mm-hmm. That's not at all the case with sports. Mm-hmm. You might revere somebody who's an incredible athlete, but they're not out there trying to get the audience to feel something. They don't, I mean, not that they don't care, but they don't care, right? They're trying to win. They're trying to achieve some goal. And we're watching there as a spectator versus I go to a theater and I watch a solo singer sing a, a concert or, or a musician perform something. And I want to be swept away. I, don't, I want to be connected with through the music, through the art form. I want as an audience member, member to be transformed. And I think that's transformation is something that's really special and unique in performance, especially at the highest level. Now, how do you define who's Barton Bryan based on those two very interesting tags that we, that we talked about right now? Well, I think that we revere people who have achieved the highest level, but I think there's growth to be had in, in striving to be better at, at those two different kind of mediums mm-hmm. in a sense. So I am somebody who strives to be my best as an athlete, you know, whether that's in the gym or just whatever I'm doing. I'm also somebody who strives to be a better and better communicator, somebody who would like to create something that others find value and find passion and find emotional connection in. And so for those reasons, I think that I strive to be an artist and I strive to be a, an athlete and I do those things to the best of my ability. And it's a journey that I'm on. It's mm-hmm. not something that I, I am an artist. I am an athlete. Like I'm on a journey and, and I think that's just part of, What's special about both of those is that it is a lifelong pursuit to do both. What is the key moment that introduced you into these two different paths? Do you recall? Well, I think it's, if you look back, I mean, I'm almost 47. So I've lived a long, you know, life as it, you know, it went and I've grew up as a basketball player. I think first and foremost was introduced to bodybuilding and working out in the gym through you know, magazines, muscle and fitness and things like that at age 12 and 13. I was, um, and so fitness, bodybuilding, uh, sports, all those things were a big part of my childhood. I never sang, I never did theater, none of Mm. those things until I went to college. Now I played piano as a kid. And so I had a little bit of a, a musical background, but I really was very shy to do anything other than what I, what I was kind of Brand, nah, nah, nobody branded me as a athlete, but that was what I did. Like, mm-hmm. who's Bart? Oh, he's the basketball player. He's, uh, you know, like, and there's a comfort when you're young and, and insecure in high school, there's a comfort in being an athlete. Mm-hmm. But when you, I could have, and I remember thinking about wanting to audition for like a singing group or a, a choir or going to musical theater and going like, I love that. But I just never had the guts to right. do it. I never had the guts. And, and, you know, and that's part of that's adolescence. Like, unless you have great mentors or people that like see something in you and like help you kind of take a leap, mm-hmm. you oftentimes, there's people that often just never get a chance to, to do that until they eventually have the confidence to say, you know what, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to do it because it matters more to me than anything. Mm-hmm. And so it wasn't until college that I mm-hmm. took a singing class and Boom, fell in love with it. I'm like, I got to do this. this is wow. awesome. I, was that an optional class or was that something mandatory? Yeah, I started college. I was a, I was a uh, physics major. So I was like, because I was good at math. I, was, I loved physics when, in high school. It was one of the only science classes I took that I was like, man, that physics is great. I love it. I'm good at it. So I was like, I went down to San Diego to be a physics major. And I took, so I took calculus and physics and the labs and all that kind of stuff. And I needed a couple more units to have a full schedule. And I'm like, oh, there's a singing class, two units. I'll just add (laughs) that in. And then, you know, lo and behold, like that (laughs) became everything. I was like, these two units that I was just kind of like throwing in there became, you know, everything that I cared about, you know, when I was doing that. And I still loved physics and, and math. And it was, you know, those were fun pursuits too. But slowly but surely, I started to really wonder what I could do with this you know, singing and, and, and what goes along with singing, which is performance and theater and, 
And it started to kind of open me up to a new world that I never allowed myself to look at. Hmm. And correct me if I'm wrong, but at the same time, you were still playing basketball? No, I, in college. So oh. I went to college. I, I thought about it. I considered it. But, and I actually tried out for one day. I didn't like the coach, didn't like the vibe that the, the whole kind of college no. uh, basketball thing was doing. And so I just, I just kind of opted out. So I think I knew at probably at that point, at 18 years old, that I was probably heading in a different direction than yeah. basketball. I mean, when I went to the school and the coach was like, why are you doing these math and physics? Let's, let's get rid of those. And I'm like, no, 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 that's what I want to do. I want to do that. And they were trying to talk me to, into doing just like real easy classes so that I could focus <laughs> on basketball. You know, and I get it. Like they, they're going to ask a lot of me and so that. But I just, I think I didn't realize at the time, but I just was probably done with basketball and ready to kind of pursue something new and something different and, and kind of see where I could go with it. So you were done with basketball, but not with athleticism in this case, or being an athlete. Not at all. I was so gung ho about bodybuilding. I was going to the gym every day. Um, San Diego, there's a Pacific beach has a gold gym or used to have a gold gym that was just kind of a, the Mecca of bodybuilding in that part of uh, Southern California. And so I'd be driving from San Diego state to PB golds every day, working out, you know, and just loving that culture, loving that part of my life too. And so that was a piece of who I was, but the basketball was kind of probably over at that point. Hmm. Now, let me bring us to the present moment. Sure. Based on what we were talking about, let me ask, how did the idea of the Mindset Forge start? Because that one combines these two passions that started early in your life, right? Yeah. I mean, obviously, there's a desire for me to, you know, kind of continue to learn. So I think there's a personal desire for me to interview people that are really successful in both mediums and learn from them and share that understanding. Now, when I started out with the podcast, I was more of a, I would interview generally anybody who I found fascinating, mm -hmm. right? People who had great stories, overcame, you know, d difficult situations in their life to become who they were. So I interviewed the mayor of Austin. I interviewed a judge here in Austin, um, some trainers, some athletes, some performing artists and just a wide variety of people. I loved it all. In fact, one of my favorite interviews was the president of uh, Houston Tilson University, the uh, all black university here in Austin and her story and what she's been through. And I just, I loved hearing people's stories and sharing that. But what I realized in season two was that I really wanted to hone in on kind of one or two things that I was really, really passionate about. Mm -hmm. And I, when I really kind of took stock of what that was, It was athletes and performing arts. It was kind of the pursuit of athletics and the pursuit of performance uh, in the arts that were the two things that really stood out to me as like that. If I could do more of that, that would be everything. We're going to get back to this point. Sure. We're going to get back to the mindset for you because it, to me, it's, it's, it's a topic itself that we could talk about for hours. So let me go back to your journey. What were some of the mistakes that you made in the early beginning, maybe as an, as an athlete or as an artist that you, that you can now in retrospect say, hmm, I shouldn't have done that, but maybe because of that, something good came out of that. Yeah, I mean, mistakes, failures, you know, it's hard. It's, I, a lot of, if you're looking back, I think some of the mistakes are related to like sh just being short-sighted or not, not thinking far enough out. I mean, just in high school with basketball, I was dead set on being a postman, like down low, back to the basket. Um, you know, so I never worked on my three pointers. Mm -hmm. I didn't really work a lot on, on dribbling skills or being a guard because I was a big man. Right mm -hmm. now, six, four in high school. Yeah. You're taller than most guys but not for college. <laughs> I, was a, I would have been a point guard in college at 6'4". And, and so if I really had aspirations of, of going and playing in college and beyond, like I should have been thinking, hey, you know what? I'm going to work on my dribbling skills, my three-pointers, mm -hmm. my ball handling, passing, all that kind of stuff so that I could put myself in a position that when I went to college that I wasn't pigeonholed into being a big man because that was the only mm -hmm. skill set I had. So that's one. And I think the, just to use the two, the kind of duality of like performance and, and that's kind of one with sports. 
And with performance, so much of being a artist and singer and performer on stage is being able to be truly authentic and and expressive about things that are uncomfortable or that you know we don't necessarily think people want to see. I think one of the things that I had that I that took me long uh, that took me longer to kind of understand and get through was that I was afraid of what people would think of me hmm. if I expressed anything than what I anything else than like strength and charisma and bravado and and so I had to learn that you know that it wasn't just about having a big strong loud opera voice hmm. or being impressive on stage I mean I'm 6'4 I'm a big guy I'm impressive when I stand on stage and sing, but there's so much more to that. There's so much more nuance to being a performer and an artist and, and being somebody who can express just the palette of emotions hmm. that makes you much more interesting to watch and much more, um, much more exciting kind of long term. So hmm. if, I'm, if I'm in that place, if I take myself back to Cal State Northridge, where I'm in the music program, and I'm studying with a voice teacher and I'm doing operas and musicals and things like that and taking theater work classes. I think the, the mistake that I made is that again, short sightedness, I was probably more about like feeling comfortable with the moment and like doing my best in the moment without thinking, okay, what do I need to do to be at the next level? What are some things about my my artistry that I need, do I need to work on to be, to take it to the next level. And so I was good, but it didn't, I didn't, I wasn't able to go out and really like achieve in the professional realm. Mm -hmm. I was good in, in where I was in that kind of, you know, circle of people, but just again, not thinking, how do I get to that next level? What do I need to work on? What are my skills that I need to kind of continue to develop? Hmm. It is. It, it's very interesting what you said. Do not get pigeonholed in, in basically in the identity of what you got in one specific place, right? If I'm not wrong, this is what it's called being a small, a big fish in small pond. Mm -hmm. Then when we're thrown into a different pond or into the ocean, we we say like, oh crap! I didn't know that. Yeah. I required those skills. So I find it very interesting. Yes. I mean, it is. Fear of failure, right? Fear of not measuring up. I think that shows up in so much and, and it stops people and it stopped me at times from going to that next level or, or getting out of my comfort zone and saying, I'm just going to go see what I can do and just put my heart and soul into something and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, because I, I, so that there were times when I did that, like I did move to New York City and I did you know, put myself out there as an actor and performing artist. And I did write a show and I performed it all around mm -hmm. and I got to do it off, off Broadway and, and got, you know, sold out, you know, a couple weekends of shows in this box theater. Like I've, I've had moments where I got to do that, but there was also times when I didn't have the confidence to put myself out there. And so I think with a lot of people, you know, there's times in your life where you make the big decision and you, you're really proud of yourself for doing that. And there's other times when you look back and say, I, I was chicken shit. Mm. You know, I was a little scared there and I played it safe instead of, you know, taking that, having the vision to take that step out of the comfort zone that we often place for ourselves. What do you recall that was the narrative probably and this is a, a question that i will come back uh, from different angles <laughs> but, and, so what was the, the the narrative in your mind those times when you said i'm going to play full in and those ones that where you said um, i will play safe do you recall what was the difference in the mindset at that time maturity was part of it you know just understanding that who i was and what i wanted was more important than what people thought about me and so when I you know made the decision to move to New York City and join an acting program and and write a show and, and live that life for two and a half years I you know I was just in this place where it's like if I don't do it now I'm never going to do it 
if I don't realize that dream of mm. really being an artist and really putting myself out there and really saying, you know what, this is me, good, the bad, and the ugly, I'm putting it out there for everyone to see and saying this, mm. let it be, right? And so some of that was time because when you're 18, 19, 20, Time is just infinite, right? Like, I have time to do that. Like, you know, I'm, I'm good now, but I'm sure there'll be time. Like, but when you're 27, 28, and you've lived a little bit, and I'm like, if I don't do this now, mm. like, it's, you know, when am I going to do it? Right? And you realize that, like, time is precious, and you got to go do it. You got to, if you believe something, if you believe in yourself that you have some kernel of talent or passion that you haven't fully realized, my goodness, go realize it. Hmm. Even if, even if it doesn't end up being, you know, somebody else's version of success, I promise you, you're a better person. You're a stronger person for having gone through that and having put yourself in that place. Thank you. <laughs> that makes me think a lot. And, um, we're going to get back to this part because I think those are the building blocks that what shaped you as a man these days and also the, the initiatives that you're having. Now, around that time, can you tell me what happened with this guy called Guy Kante? Guy Kante. So Guy Kante is my name when I lived in West Africa. And I actually have on my left shoulder, I have a tattoo of an anvil, which is the blacksmith anvil, like kind of a tool of the blacksmith. And it says Kante. And underneath it, it says Brian. Mm. And those are my two last names. Conte is my, my, the family that I live with, the Conte family in West Africa, in Jajabine, Mauritania. And then Brian's my last name here. And so it's honoring the two families that, in a sense, raised me on some level. And so when I joined the Peace Corps in 2003, no, 2001, and I had no idea where they were going to send me. They don't really tell you. They, hmm. they invite you to a place. And so, but I spoke French and I'd been to Morocco a couple of times. And so I had some experience in French West Africa. And so that was generally where I wanted to go. And so I got this, in, you know, this invitation, go to Mauritania. You really couldn't Google anything wow. back there. You know, it was, you could do a little bit and you find a couple of pictures, but it's pretty much the unknown. So I moved to, I took, took it up, you know, I signed up for Peace Corps, got invited Ended up in Mauritania, did a couple of months of studying, you know, lo local languages and customs. And I was going to be teaching English. So I had to learn to teach English mm. to, you know, as a second language. And then I was sent to a, t a town called Jajabine. And they didn't really have, I mean, it was a small enough town, a couple thousand people, village, no power, no running water. So the only place I could stay was a, was kind of a hut at the, in the compound of Kome Kante and his family. So it was Kome, he was the blacksmith, his son Guy, and Laji Hujeji was the wife. There was Hawa, there was Bakri, there was Sidi, there was Abu, there was all these kids. Wow. And then there's this big, you know, <laughs> lumbering American <laughs> with big smile and lots of excitement and no language skills and no concept. And I, you know, they said, Well, you're gonna stay here. I said, okay, so I moved my stuff in and the Peace Corps director said, tells the director, tells Kome Kante, what are we going to name him? He said, well, my first same son's name's Guy, so you'll be Guy Kante too. And I didn't really understand why that we we're going to have the same name. <laughs> I, that was fine. I, you know, it's kind of like, why do you call somebody junior? I guess it's, there's some sort of a, you know, like honoring the first son by naming right. me the same name as the first son. So I became Guy Kante. It was a lot easier for them to say than Barton Bryan. Yeah. There's a lot of chewing of vowels. Nobody could say my name right over there. So, so anyway, I was Guy Kante for two and a half years in the Peace Corps volunteer. Best experience of my life. The ups, the downs, I mean, the tears, the laughter. Mm -hmm. It was all while 9-11 had just happened. Whew. So, you know, you're really out there in the middle of nowhere in an Islamic Republic, you know, kind of trusting that... Mm -hmm. You know, the people in this community were taking care of me, looking out for me, had my best interest. And all of those things were true. And so while the, the whole you know, entire population of America back home was seeing, you know, was repetitively seeing that the, the, you know, the towers being blown up and, and worrying about their safety and all that. 
first of all, I never saw that stuff. And I mean, I, it looked, it was like a couple of days after it happened that I finally got to watch a, you know, CNN and watch the actual towers blow up. But like back in the village, there was no TV. I didn't ever see this repetitive wow. kind of like visual information of like how scary life was and how dangerous the world was. And so what my experience was and for good or for, you know, for bad, it was, do I trust the people around me who pray as Muslims, who live their life kind of devoted to Islam and all that, but seem to really care about me mm. and seem to really want me there. And it doesn't seem to matter that all of this happened because this black African community was all about their relationship with me. They were supportive of America and they didn't want me to leave. Mm. And it was important to them that I knew that they did not want me to leave wow. and that they wanted me there even though there's so many reasons why I could have gone home. Mm. <laughs> so that's part of why Conte is on my arm. It's not just like, hey, that's a cool name. It's like in the midst of like literally the world changing, you know, with 9-11 and all the things that happened, the whole like understanding of how scary and dangerous the world was, I was protected by the culture of the people that actually had done this, like Islam, mm. and yet here I was safe and protected and supported. And so it was very unique and very special. And I, I you know, make sure that when people ask me like, or have negative viewpoints of, of Islam or Muslim culture or whatever, I always try to tell that story because I think people don't realize that like, you know, I mean, it's just, it's important people understand that human beings, you know, caring for each other is, is kind of the heart of who we are, you know, and, and it doesn't really matter what title you put on them. Like if they, you know, it's just, anyway, I, it was special and Guy Conte was wow. a big part of why I am who I am today. Thank you for sharing that story. It's fascinating. Thank you very much. Yeah. So that was the time in South, in Mauritania. Mauritania, yeah. That shaped clearly your vision of the world. Do you recall what was the 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 shift that happened and maybe repercussions or how that affected the rest of your life, even today with your kid? How does that affect that that event? So one of the things I loved about my village was at five o'clock at the mosque, all of the village elders would come and sit and people would bring their grievances and questions and stuff like that. And so there was a village elder named Eli Gandega and Eli's no longer with us, but I was, he lived in France for many years and worked and uh, so he had a different perspective of Mauritania and of just Western culture versus African culture and things like that. And so I had asked him like, what, what's the meaning of life to you? Hmm. And he said, when you're young, the most important thing to do is get your education and travel as much as you can hmm. so that you can really see the world as the world hmm. and not as something that you just hear back down on TV, on the radio or whatever, like to really see and understand the world and, and, and to live within the world and not just live within your town or your country. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I just I agreed with him, but I was, the more I think about it, like the, and I think about my kid who's seven and, you know, travel and taking him to Mauritania, taking him to my village at some point when kind of everything gets back to, you know, traveling mm -hmm. is appropriate and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, just wanting my son to experience the world and see as much of it as possible so that he can understand the way I did, you know, in my 20s, just mm -hmm. meeting people and understanding, respecting people and, and appreciating just how most of the world is really, really just about connecting with each other and about sharing and about laughter and about you know, wanting to find connection and, and understanding with each other. And, you know, of course that's, there's other parts of the world or other aspects of the world that are dangerous and confusing and concerning. And, and I'm not saying that those things don't exist too, but, you know, to travel and to 
put yourself out there to meet people and, and really, you know, make connections and make, have, have something where a, a person makes an impact on you. It's not about me over there changing the community of Jajabine. I did a little bit. They did a lot hmm. for me. Like that kind of equation of like, oh, I went to the you know, Peace Corps and I came to a village and I helped them build things. Yeah, that's, that's the ethnocentric side of the story. It's like American man goes to Mauritania and helps people in a village. That's the story that kind of an American in America would tell mm. that would justify the reason I was there. But what the real reason I was there was to open my eyes and to allow me to love and care for and, and have an incredible time spending and learning about these people and their perspective so that I could for the rest of my life understand that mm. A, we have it really, really good here in America, mm. but also there is something so much bigger than just, you know, going to the Eiffel Tower or mm. going to, you know, a town to see a thing, to connect with the community, to connect with people and to share, to break bread in a sense is probably the most important thing that you can do when you travel. Because mm. what sometimes we need to get marketed another idea so that we buy into the idea and we transform through, through, through that experience. Yeah. yeah. It reminds me actually part of what you said of how I got here to the U.S. I didn't know that the journey that was going to bring me here mm -hmm. was going to be, in your, like in your case, a transformative journey. That, that now it turned into asking people really <laughs> questions about yeah. their lives. So let me, let, me, let me get us back to a little bit of the athletic and performing um, artsy journey. Let's let's bring it back here because now I understand where several pieces of your story start creating this this uh, mindset that you are ha that that you have and the lust for learning from others, like you said. You, you, you basically you were open from that time, maybe earlier, to receive unbiased information and actually let yourself connect with other people through that is, is that along the lines i think being coachable or being open to learn at whatever age is so important i mean i think teenagers often act like they have it all figured out which is one of the reasons why it's really hard to talk to a teenager <laughs> uh but i think at any point in our lives there's a natural desire for people to say well this is who i am I've figured it out. I am this, I am this. We create a bunch of titles for ourselves. We exist in a small, a small enough kind of fishbowl where we could feel like a big fish, like we mentioned uh -huh. earlier. Um, and it's just very comfortable to be there. But the probably more interesting thing for me and hopefully for a lot of people is like, let's keep learning. Let's keep asking people that know things that we don't. Mm -hmm. We don't necessarily have to want to be an Olympic swimmer, but man, asking an Olympic swimmer with three gold medals, what does he understand? How does he understand failure? Mm -hmm. Like, sign me up for that, you know, conversation, you know, because if I grab one or two little ideas or nuggets from that, that I can implement in my own life, mm -hmm. like I'm 1% better or 1% closer to the, the journey that I want to go on and the place I want to potentially end up. So in that sense, it is the skill of being coachable and finding coaches or mentors in this case. Yeah. In, in your case, Barton, what are the role models or mentors that you ha had in the past or maybe you still have here in the present? Do you recall? Yeah, I mean, one that stands out is when I was in high school, there was a personal trainer who basically took, he used to own a gym and he brought all of his gym equipment to his front porch and it was rusted <laughs> and it was, but a bunch of high school athletes and some like uh, older bodybuilders would come to his, his front patio porch and he would sit there and he would basically tell everybody what to do. And his name is Gary Mann. Mm -hmm. And so when I was 17, 18 years old, I was a skinny, like just, you know, lean and mean but uh basketball player body and and i but i really wanted to like put on muscle and get stronger and, and i had the aspirations of the bodybuilding thing and 
I would go to his, I would drive from my town to, to the town where he was, wow. which is about 20 miles. And I remember the drive I did every day. And, and I, my friend, I got my friends involved in it. We're like, there were so many of us that would drive together. We'd carpool out there. And, and Gary was just one of those personalities that came from like a, an era of American history where it's kind of the strong man era, even before mm-hmm. really Arnold Schwarzenegger. Like he was in that time of like just people that would do really strong man things. And, and, had, and he just had this bravado and persona that was just so electric and so charismatic. But he cared so much about each and every one of us. Mm -hmm. And it was just a really special, safe environment to like be an athlete and just show up and just go for it and put everything you had on the table and just, you know, get your butt kicked and, and, and just get a high five from it and, and, and walk away just feeling like you did the most important thing you could have Mm -hmm. done in that, you know, 60 to 90 minutes. And he just had a magic about you know, seeing you, mm. even though there was 10 other, you know, guy, la- ladies and guys there, 15 other people, you felt like, <laughs> you know, he was looking at you and, and giving you that care and attention. Wow. Any other mentors or coaches that you recall besides Gary Mann? Gary Mann, yeah. And my dad, mm-hmm. you know, and my dad has a very different story because he got polio when he was mm-hmm. in the Philippines at 50 years, at 1950 so he was 12 years old so before the vaccine came out before all those things and he was in an iron lung for 16 months and really in a wheelchair his his entire adult life and so he was not an athlete you know obviously from beyond that point he was probably a a pretty good athlete before he Mm -hmm. got polio but um he became a musician He, he learned how to play harmonica and he actually was able to play professional harmonica and wow. some jazz, blues, and rock bands throughout the 60s. And, you know, there's even old recordings of him, you know, playing concerts and all that kind of stuff. So there's this artistic side that comes from my father. And, but he also loved sports and all that. And he always wanted me to pursue mm. that stuff because he just knew how important it was to, to me. But, uh, you know, my dad was just, you know, my biggest fan uh, mm. when it came to... Uh, just all the things I was trying to do and he actually taught me physics and I, wow. I need I wanted to skip trigonometry so I could get to college and take calculus so over the summer between uh, senior year and going to college he taught me trigonometry wow and I passed through out of trigonometry by taking a test and was mm-hmm. able to go on to to college and take calculus and so you know the, these the, he just he was one of those really smart guys who just you know, had a really, you know, there's a whole, you could do a whole podcast on his story, you know, being, you know, having polio and all those things, but, uh, you know, just who he was and what he represented and his authentic person, you know, who he was as an authentic person just, uh, was probably, I mean, obviously the most important relationship in my life, you know, even after he passed away in 2005, mm-hmm. just who he represented. And when I would do my one man show, after he passed away, I would always talk to him right before I would go on stage. I would look up and it was kind of my version of prayer. And I would say, this is for you, dad. I'm going to be myself. I'm going to give my all. And I'm and like, and I would say something like that. It was like, if I knew my dad was watching, I knew that I would take it to another level. Mm-hmm. It's like, I knew that he, that my dad, if I could honor my father in this performance, mm-hmm that I could get to another level of creativity and expression that I hmm. probably, that I probably wouldn't get, or at least I felt that way. Mm-hmm. That's, I, yeah. It was a vehicle for me to really just say, you know what? Fuck it. I'm just going to jump off the cliff and just go for it and be my most expressive self and see what happens. And so I would mm-hmm. talk to my father before I would step on stage to connect in that way hmm. that brings me two questions uh, uh, let's see which one uh, we go with first one of them is related to to the habits and routines that you have it, clearly you you have a very interesting set of rituals even we, we can call them like that before performing or before training and, and that's something that i would like to get into but the other one before we get into that is and we were talking about this a few minutes ago what's your relationship with failure 
So let me bring a little bit of context. When you're bodybuilding, you're, you have to go, your muscles go to failure, which is something that the majority of people, is like they run away from, right? But in the case of bodybuilding, you're, you're aiming to get to failure at some point, maybe not the entire time, but there is a different relationship with that, something that it's very innate to our human nature to escape from. There is a difference there. That is in the athletic realm. But in the perform performance realm, there is this afraid, like you said, to look like a failure. So can you describe in those two realms, what is your relationship to, to failure? I think in the performance realm, you know, there's the business side of failure, like, oh, I wasn't successful at becoming a professional singer. Like that's, I think that's a, that's a more of an intellectual version of somebody trying to put a value on whether it was worth becoming a singer or not. Mm. I think what, what's real failure and the failure that matters the most is, did I prepare as best I could so that I could show up in that moment of performance and give it my all? Mm. And if the answer is yes, then that's not failure. That's success. The second question about failure is, was I my authentic, an expressive self in that moment. You know, in acting, my acting teacher would say, you can't be somebody else if the role is a really, really enthusiastic, like energetic person, then you have to be you at your most enthusiastic, wow. right? You can't fake some other person. Like you have to, your emotions are real. Like acting is living truthfully through imaginary circumstances. So your so failure for me in, in a in, in a performance where you're acting or singing would be to not live truthfully, hmm. to be to fake it, to have a shtick about my performance that's superficial and and, and for approval or mm. for laughs instead mm. of like to truly express the thing that I set out to, to, to show, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, and, and in that sense, that's really a personal growth kind of gauge, right? Like, and in that sense, I want to avoid failure in the sense that like, I want to show up whether there's one person in the room or a hundred or a thousand mm -hmm. and I want to be prepared and I want to have the confidence that I did the work so that when I'm stepping on the stage or I'm going to perform that I'm not guessing what the words are, mm. trying to remember the notes or like all those intellectual things that would get in your way and take you out of the moment. I want to be right. I want to be ready. I want to perform at my best. Uh, and then I, I just want to give, all, give my all. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't work, like if it didn't tr translate well or the, you know, the room was kind of unaffected by it, then maybe mm -hmm. I need to look at like, okay, what, what didn't go right? Like maybe what, mm. what did I miss there? Like what, how could I make it better? And I think those are, those are aspects of like, you know, success and failure that, that you always have to be able to do as an, as an artist is, is kind of figure out, okay, was I my, am I happy with how I showed up mm. and how I expressed myself? And if you could say yes about that, then you go, okay, what are some things that I maybe could have done better? What are some things that maybe didn't work or, that I could amplify that could make the experience or the performance even better. And so I think th those are, I want to kind of make sure that that is a, as a piece of the, the answer, because mm -hmm. when you're doing a sport, you want to, you lost, hmm. right? Like if I'm a, to use the, the Olympic swimmer, you know, I swim as fast as I can across the pool. And I, if I got first, I got first. If I it, like, nobody's going, well, your form could have been better there. And I wasn't really moved by how he flip turned there. <laughs> doesn't matter right you know it's it's who got to the wall first mm. so that's a very like you know one one to Zero. one you know relationship with like we just want to see you win mm. and if you lost okay well let's think about look at the technique look at the form look at you know things that you could have done to to show up better and and be a little bit more technically uh, you know efficient so that you can win the next round but when, when it comes to art and performance then it's then it's a lot more personal 
Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's just the way it is. Like, and so, so with failure, I, I really think if you, if you don't, the problem that people have, I think, is that they get so wrapped up in not failing hmm. that, they, that they avoid the effort. They, like it stops them from giving effort. Like, I don't want to fail at this. I'm just going to do a mediocre effort. Think, think about business. Think about podcast. I'm going to do an average effort. Well, you're never going to achieve what you want because you never went all into it. Mm. Right? So if you, if you never give the effort because you don't want to fail, then it wasn't mm. worth doing anyway. Or you, or you, didn't, you failed at the very beginning because you didn't even set yourself up to succeed. Let's take all that back to the gym. And this is important because I think the, under, the idea is that like I'm supposed to go into the gym and just crush my legs and like go to failure all the time. And what's actually so interesting is that in Lee Haney, seven-time Mr. Olympia, Lee Haney said this just a few months ago on the, at the Arnold Classic. He said, you stimulate, don't annihilate. Hmm. And he's talking about when you go into the gym, it's not about annihilating your muscles like we kind of imagine that Arnold and his buddies did at Venice Beach or at, at, at the Gold's Gym kind of mecca in Venice. You, you can't do that and have success. Your body breaks down. It won't, mm. it won't recover effectively to get stronger. You actually have to stimulate and get yourself to a, a, a point of volume where you're able to, you've, you've worked the muscle enough but if you go too far, do too many sets, or do too much weight too many times, the nervous system just can't handle it. And it breaks down and it won't grow. Mm-hmm. So there's this really interesting balance with like, yes, at the gym, you have to, you can't be afraid of, of squatting a lot of weight because you're afraid of failure. But you don't necessarily want to go to the gym and just squat till failure with 300 mm-hmm. pounds every day. You're, gonna, you're not going to be doing well in a month or two. So there's this whole kind of balance of you can't be afraid of the moment. You've got to go in there and put the work and put the effort in, but you also have to have some parameters around what you're doing so that you're not mm. just blowing all your, your energy and, and muscles and, you know, so far beyond what they're capable of that they're just breaking down and, and, and getting worse. And so that's, a, that's something that, um, that's tricky. And it's because we, I think people that are desperate to get strong. They go to the gym, they spend three hours there. I see plenty of people at the gym that are just there too long. And they're doing the, too many of the same exercises too many times a week. And I'm not their trainer, so it's not my job to tell them. What, but like sometimes in the desperation of wanting to be successful, we don't understand that like, that's not, all, that's not actually how it works. Mm. Like we have to, there's an ebb and flow. There's a, there's a balance to recovery water, sleep, hydration, food, all those kinds of things, and how that plays into the 90 minutes that you spend at the gym mm-hmm. or on that run or whatever you're trying to achieve. And that sounds like it is a, a job of every person to know thyself practically, right? So for me, for example, recovery could be 8 to 10 hours of sleeping, let's say. And for you, it's seven, seven and a half. It's perfect timing. But that we don't know until, until we, we find out. So in your case, how do you find out what is, what is that thin razor edge, edge line? How did you find out? I mean, you just experiment. I mean, I, mm. honestly, I would sleep longer if I could. <laughs> you know, I, I, I get up for a 5.30 a.m. boot camp at 4.20 in the morning, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. So, you know, I'm going to sleep at 8.45, 9 p.m., but... You know, I couldn't, I can't go to sleep at 7.45. My, my kid's just going to sleep. Like, you know what I mean? Like there's some, some of it has to do with like, what's the best I can do with my mm. lifestyle? Like, you know, if you're a mom or a dad or you've got long hours and weird schedule, like there may not be a world where you can sleep eight to 10 hours. Mm-hmm. Like that may not be effective uh, or this may not be possible. But understand that sleeping eight hours a night is better for your recovery than sleeping seven hours a night. Like it just is, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, just like drinking, you know, enough water is better than not drinking enough or getting enough protein. You know, like there's, there's these 
benchmarks or metrics that if you do those things, it maximizes your, your recovery and your results. So I think it's, it's, you don't want to wake up feeling exhausted or feeling like you're, you didn't, you're not fully recovered. So I think that you just try to add, you know, to do what you can understanding that it's important and never saying that the more you get, the better off you're going to be, uh, with, with your, in the sense of like, showing up now for the sport or whatever you're doing mm -hmm. that makes sense mm -hmm. I, I do also think that mental recovery mm -hmm. for your job for you know if you're an artist and you're you're you know trying to work on your voice or work on piano or doing you know like get better at something like your mental focus has a lot to do with how you sleep how much water you drink those types of things too so you don't want to not think about those things if you're a performer too because i think they matter mm -hmm. Now, talking about those uh, tiny details or habits that we sometimes we don't even remember or that we don't realize that we're performing. In your case, it sounds that you have crafted over the years several um, habits around recovery, around nutrition, around movement, around mindset, which is what brings us later into the, the Mindset Forge. So what are those habits or routines that are part of your, or your, your daily lifestyle that make the best version of yourself? First of all, it's prioritizing the things in my life that are most important. Mm -hmm. So family, health, and the, you know, my, my job with Camp Gladiator, my podcast, those things, and clearing out some of the other things that don't matter you know, and don't move the needle. Perfect example of that is I don't know how people watch several different, you know, Netflix series and, mm -hmm. you know, Hulu and like they, they're just obsessed about all these things, yeah. which is great, but it's just all kind of passive wasting of time. And so I really believe that like, if it matters to you, you'll find the time. So the first thing that I, that I do is I say, okay, yeah, my family matters. My son gets home from you know, school at three o'clock. You know, that time between three, three to five, kind of that time before dinner is super important. So if I'm scheduling other things there, then I'm clearly saying that it isn't mm -hmm. important. So can I put my phone down? Can I be present in those moments? So things like that is specific to sports or to going to the gym is I make sure that I, the earlier I can get to the gym, the better. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I have an early boot camp. I'm not going to the gym at 3.30 a.m., But as soon as I leave my boot camp, I'm already driving straight to the gym. I'm thinking about all the things. I'm actually thinking about what I'm doing that day. And I'll tell you, I am a personal trainer. I've been doing this for 15 years. I have a personal trainer. Let me say that again. I have a personal trainer. Not because I don't know what to do, but because you are better when you have a coach. I have a podcast. I have a coach. Right. Like, again, if we're if we're in the mindset of like, I want to grow, I want to develop, I want to become my best self in whatever thing that you're you're reaching towards. You should have a coach or a mentor, somebody who's guiding you that's been there, that's that's farther along than you are. And so I, I've hired a you know, bodybuilding coach. I don't meet with him. He helps me program my workout and I have it all broken down into a spreadsheet for the next four or five weeks. And, you know, we, we touch base once in a while, but I know when I go into the gym, you know, yesterday I went to the gym, I had to squat 290 times three for five sets. Mm. And so as I'm doing my warm up, I'm making sure my hips are mobile. I'm making sure my core is engaged. I'm checking in with my low back because I know exactly what my goal is that day. And I know that it's appropriate for where, where I need to be and, and that, that the amount of volume, the amount of weight, the amount of reps, all those things are based on kind of the science behind like, you know, improving in little minute incremental changes over the course, you know, of, you know, four to six weeks that will allow me, my body to truly grow and not break down. Mm -hmm. And so that has been a game changer because there were definitely times where I would just show up at the gym and kind of do my, you know, do what I felt like, you know, okay, last week I did this, I'm yeah. going to do a little bit more and all that. And that was effective. I, I had results, but when I hired a coach exponentially wow. better. And so I just, 
just a shout out to Cody Hill, my coach. Uh, he's awesome. He's here in Austin and uh, he's just, he's just, he's a man of science and he, mm. no, the numbers don't lie. If you're, you know, building muscle and your numbers are going up on your squats and your bench and those that, like you're going to get stronger. Like it's not a, it's not magic. Mm -hmm. it, it takes work and it takes, you know, repetition and all those things. Now, Barton, you have been doing the, the, the mindset forge for over a year, more than a year, just over a year, just over a year. Yeah. What are the lessons that you have extracted from those interviews? Well, first of all, that I love interviewing people. Absolutely love it. There's the energy and, and honestly in person. And thank you for that's why one of the reasons I love that you actually came here to my house because just interacting with somebody in person, making eye contact, sharing ideas is just it's a special way to, you know, take people's lessons in, of, from their life and share it with a lot of people. And, and then from a personal standpoint, just getting a chance to learn and connect with people who are you know, achieving at such a high level in whatever they're doing, but specifically lately, you know, of course, sports and performance. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's hard to pick one or two things that I've, that you know, been big, the biggest lessons. I will say that interviews that stick out to me are ones where the, the interview or the guests really opened up about something truly kind of like deep in their life that, that became kind of an aha moment. Mm. to why they you know, are who they are and how they were able to kind of like get through um, to that next level or something like that. And so I think sometimes athletes are just really good athletes and they push, 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 push. And that, and that kind of mindset really just kind of gets them to the top. Mm. And then there's other people that, that learned along the way that maybe kind of made that huge shift. Um, You know, and so I, when I look at somebody like Brittany Conigati, who was a semi-professional soccer player and a dancer and really had like just this incredible ability to kind of be an athlete and be on stage and, and, and um, you know, it's awesome to hear her story because you're just like, wow, like she is incredible. Mm -hmm. um, but somebody like Adam Flowers, who's just to take another uh, performing artist, he He is the opera singer that I interviewed uh, mm -hmm. this season. And, you know, he was kind of like me. He didn't, he found singing in high school instead of in college, but he just kind of happened upon opera and, you know, it just became everything to him. And it became this kind of monumental moment where he, uh, where his life kind of shifted and he realized that he wanted to do this, but he, he almost kind of talked himself out of it so many wow. times until people got in his way and said, no, <laughs> you're supposed to be an opera singer. Like, you, you know, and, and I don't know, just every story, whether it's specifically relatable to your life or not, I think is an opportunity to learn something or appreciate something about how people are and how they, how they, you know, choose the life that they do. And I think the thing about people who are great at performance, whether they're athletes or performing artists, is that they have they challenge themselves at that thing so often that they really get to fine tune that mm -hmm. thing that we might not want to deal with all the time, you know, just showing up, being very present, being very, um, just willing to put it all out there daily, mm -hmm. failing at it over and over until we eventually get really good at it. And mm -hmm. so that's, it reminds me to do that on a daily basis. It reminds me to also just, just embrace the journey and, you know, not be so judgmental of people that aren't necessarily like on that path, like, but just understand that like people, people are at whatever their place they're at in their life because of a set of circumstances. And yes, I'd like everyone to be kind of learning, you know, in this kind of growth mm -hmm. mode and learning, but I understand that like just getting somebody to listen to a podcast, You know, sometimes that's just impossible to do for whatever reason. They just don't want to click on a link and spend 45 minutes listening to a podcast. And I just, I just got to a place of more acceptance around, mm -hmm. you know, people are either ready to learn or not, and they're going to respond well or they're not. And that's just kind of how people are. And my goal is to help people who are ready to learn and want to kind of take the, another step in the direction of of growth and, and achieving what they want and help them along the way.
Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that's why I keep leaning into this. Talking about learning in this case, in, in, in your personal trajectory, what, are, what is a failure that at that time it, it seems something maybe devastating or something that really affected you, but thanks to that, it brought you to a better position that you could have been without that. Do you recall anything around that? Give me a second. I, 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 I want to make sure I think of a good uh, one that really, that isn't just superficial. Um, say it a different way. Let me, let me just give me a sec, sec, okay. second to think about it. Sure. Do you recall an event that at that time it probably broke you from within? And after years that passed, uh, past that event, you said, oh, okay, it was great that it happened at that time. I'm thankful that it happened. So I'm, I'm going back to college where I'm a, a voice major and I auditioned for La Boheme, the opera La Boheme, as uh, Colline, who's the, ba- the bass, the main bass role. There's maybe like four guys. There's Rodolfo, there's Martello, there's um, Sonard, and then there's Colline. And Colline is the, the basso profundo. So I, I have to work up the aria and I've got some like kind of songs that I have to there are pieces of the uh, opera that I have to sing as the audition and I was overly confident because I had done the aria for the director in a opera workshop class a few weeks earlier and he was like oh I see Colleen like he he was seeing me as the guy he was like oh that sounds great let's tweak here let's do this but like in his mind he had his Colleen Right. And so that put a un inappropriate amount of confidence and and, and ego in my thought process. So I was like, I don't, you know, normally you would hire like a, a, a pianist and work through the like other pieces and make kind of get them right and make sure that they had all the kind of inflection that would be, but I, I was going to do that myself. I didn't, you know, and so I, I, I rehearsed and I practiced and all that, but I, I needed to have done more. I needed to have rehearsed it more because I went in there and I sang, you know, it was, I was on stage in the, in, the, in the opera auditorium and I sang the aria and it was fine. But when I got to the kind of recitative and kind of the more of the like talking stuff where you, you know, it's not, it's not an aria, but it's, it's, so it's a little bit more technical and it doesn't, it's, it's a little bit harder to memorize and I just froze and like, it's like all of the music <laughs> just went gone. Like it was gone. And, and so I just kind of, I, we, we tried again, tried it again. And I just kept stopping and I'm so, I just said, I'm so sorry, Dr. Scott, I'm so sorry. And I walked off stage and what I should have done was immediately gone to his office and said, I would like to apologize for not being prepared and, and, and just, I'd, I'd like an opportunity to, to make it up to you and, and show you what I can do. And I didn't do that because I was so embarrassed because my ego was too, I was, you know, I had, I had my ego and then I failed and then that failure turned into embarrassment and turned into shame. So I never really addressed it with him. And then and then, and then it was just like, okay, now I just wait and see if he's like going to like gift me the role, even though I totally bombed it or if he's going to like, and so a couple of days later, you know, I hadn't heard from him. He hadn't heard from me and he puts out the, the roster and I'm playing a small role, you know, I'm still in the show. I'm not in the chorus, but I'm not Coline. <laughs> And the other bass baritone in the opera got that part and he was going to play it the whole time. Mm-hmm. So he was basically, Dr. Scott was going to put me as the, they, were, they, they tend to always put two characters or two, two singers at, in the same role. Mm-hmm. So I might sing it one night and then the other guy would sing it the other night. And it, you kinda, so it gives two people mm-hmm. a chance to sing the same role. So he got the role. So you know, basically I lost the role. And so devastating, but also like what an important lesson about like, you got to have your ego in check. Like, and you never, it's nothing's, 
nothing is just like going to be given to you. Even if you think like, Hey, this, you know, this guy likes me. He, he sees me in this role. I still have to show up and be, and remind him again and again that I'm not a joke, that I'm, I am serious about this and I'm ready to take on this role. And so, yeah, I, I didn't get it. Hmm. And, you know, it was, it was a tough pill to swallow at the time. Um, but I mean, I, I look back and I say, you know, what did I learn from that experience? That was probably the last time I made that mistake of not being prepared, mm. of not showing up at my absolute best, or at least at, at a, with, the, with the stakes that high. You know, I mean, I, I'm sure there's times in my life where I could have been more prepared, but like with stakes that high, that lesson taught me probably more because I didn't get the role than had I become Coline and gotten to like kind of live out that that dream of playing that character. This this section of what we are talking about and, uh, and other ones uh, not so long ago, actually during this hour, remind me a lot of we don't rise to the level of our expectations. We fall to the level of our practice. Basically, is that along the lines? Of that is exactly what happened. The expectations were up here. Mm -hmm. I mean, but... The, pra the actual practice and preparation that I put in was minimal because I already knew the aria. I mm. already had that song memorized. I'd performed it so many times that I just assumed the other stuff would be easy, no problem. Like, so I, I set myself up to fail because I did not put in the work. I did not meet the expectations mm -hmm. that, were, that, that w should have been where I, where, I, where I showed up at. So, hmm. so let me couple this realization or lesson from practice expectations and in between what we're talking about what happens when someone is has practiced enough has all the muscle all the memory muscle or all, all the performance has been nailed down to the point but when it's time to perform there is stage fright you, i guess you've been in those situations as an artist and maybe as an athlete as well how, how do you deal with stage fright, even knowing that you're super prepared? And it's, this is a funny thing because I'm realizing how the mind is so tricky that if it's not this trap, there is another trap and another trap. It's, it's something that you know, performers deal with all the time. And, and, and Taylor Brown, who's a mindful mm -hmm. performance coach, talked about mm -hmm. you know, just how we have to... Those things are going to be there. We can't not... We can't expect that you show up for a really important moment in your life and that you're not going to have fear, anxiety, stress, whatever. And if you're doing a physical activity, whether it's performance or, or sport, that stress is going to affect your body, the tension in your body, the way you breathe, all those things. So it's even more important that you're that you're aware that those things are going to come up and that they're going to affect your body which if your body is your instrument so if you're a dancer mm. singer actor anything where your body is expressing your art then you better have a really good grasp of how to calm your nerves down so one thing that just happened is in the interview that i was talking to an mma fighter he was talking about how do you get ready for a fight you know, where you're, you know, where you're, you're going to literally go out there and fight for your life. Uh, and he talks about breathing and mm -hmm. getting in kind of a parasympathetic state. And I think for me, going back to like talking to my father, that was a way for mm -hmm. me to not just like settle my body down, but also connect with something that was more important than the stress. Mm -hmm. Right, like the stress didn't go away. The anxiety, the, the, the stage fright in a sense didn't go away. I just didn't focus on it. Like I knew that there were people in the audience that, I, that was important, that, I, that were there, that I really wanted to impress or I wanted them to like the show. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't focused on like, oh my God, what will he think? Mm -hmm. I'm focused on, I'm gonna do great for my father. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna express myself at my best ability. You know? And so it superseded the, the anxiety and, and those other what we call negative emotions. Mm -hmm. And it allowed me to, to flow 
and to let my body kind of relax into what I was doing. You know, you just remind me of something super interesting. I just learned that Warren Buffett, when he has to to um, write a, a report for advisors and all the board and blah, 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 mm -hmm. he writes it as if he would be talking to his sister and he writes the entire letter at, at the end instead of Elizabeth or wh whatever was her, her name, dear board of advisors or board, right? So, so he changes the entire focus, like you said. In this case, he was performing on a business side, let's say, with that report that he was creating. And in your case, it is the performance. And even though there are stakes there, people expecting something from you, you are actually more focused in, 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 your, com in your personal commitment. In this case, how you want your dad to, to have experienced this one. Is that? Yeah, yeah I, I think sometimes it really is helpful to, to actually put somebody out in the audience <sighs> who's like, I'm, I'm communicating to them, <laughs> right? Because that person may be a, like someone who loves you and doesn't, you're not feeling judged by that person out there. It's kind of an imaginary concept, but mm -hmm. just going back to kind of the nuts and bolts of performance, pre-performance habits. I think one of the big ones is breathing and the other one is movement. Uh, and I don't mean like jumping jacks. I mean, some sort of movement that allows your body to just ex be expressive and free up. You know, you know, if we sit and kind of just stew or get mm -hmm. nervous, that, that kind of pent up energy is, can be kind of rigid, <laughs> but if we're able to move and flow and, and the, you may have listeners that find themselves walking around, pacing the floor when they're on the phone call, mm. like that's kind of, you know, we're, there are people that are very kind of physically express more expressive when they're moving and they're kind of in a flow state in a sense. Mm -hmm. And, um, Phil DeRue just talked about how he shadow boxes before he presents mm -hmm. to groups. He's not about to go for a fight. He's about to present in front of, you know, mm -hmm. trainers and, and people in the industry, but he shadow boxes because it puts him in a flow state. Mm -hmm. It allows his movement and his breath to kind of be repetitive and, and relaxes him. And so, I mean, we, we shouldn't all shadow box because that's not what we do, right? right. Unless you're, uh, you know, have that background, but find something that allows you to move freely and, and expressively. Uh, and so there's actually like acting and singing techniques that help free the body up to be more expressive and be more open that you, you would learn in some sort of a, a, uh, you know, actor's mm -hmm. studio or something like that. It's a connection with the body then. Yeah. That yeah. Okay. Just like when you're, you know, you would never walk into the gym to put 300 pounds and start squatting. Right. All right. You got to warm up, you gotta <laughs> do your mobility. You got to like, you know, start with 135 pounds, work up to 225, 275. Maybe you do to 300. Like, you know, those things like it, it would be, make no sense to just throw 300 pounds on a bench press and try to do it. Like you, you got to warm up and just like any kind of performance, if you expect to show up at your best, you got to, you got to show up. You got to, you got to warm up in, in some way, shape or form mm -hmm. so that your brain and your body are ready for that moment. Great. <laughs> We're getting to the, to the end and I want to be very respectful of, of your time. We could talk for hours, honestly. Yeah, yeah, now that I, maybe we're going to have to have a second, a second uh, version of this one when you are in the seventh uh, anniversary of, of the podcast. But yeah, let's, let's start getting to, to, to the end of the conversation. Yeah. Um, Barton, what is something that you have unlearned over the last years that improved the quality of your life? That you have unlearned? Unlearned. Unlearned. With a sport, with an art form, or whatever your pursuit, business, whatever it is, there is an innately a lot of ego and a lot of me wrapped into wanting to be successful. Right? Like, I want to do this. I want to achieve something. Right? And that the thing that I've had to unlearn is that I've had to kind of let go of like the me in it and bring the people along that matter most. And so a few years ago, showing up, you know, for my family, it was an either that or I show up for myself. Like it's almost like I, I made it, I made it one or the other. 
And now I've, I've figured out, or I'm doing a better job at figuring out how to, to make the two intertwine, you know, whether that's, you know, the podcast and sharing it with my family and talking about, you know, my, the guests with my son and Mm -hmm. even talking about my son in the podcast, Mm -hmm. like finding ways to make it all part of our journey together, Mm -hmm. because there's a lot of successful people who aren't successful at marriage or Mm -hmm. don't end up being great fathers or mothers because they were so focused Mm -hmm. on them and their goal, their pursuit that it was at the demise or at the peril of the people around them that love them and I don't want to be that type of person like I don't want to I don't want my son to be in therapy therapy at 25 years old because dad had a podcast (laughs) right like that's not a successful story I want my son to say man I love that my dad always spent time with me always he always you know made me feel like I was super important and I was loved Mm -hmm. and I got to watch him grow something mm-hmm. I got to watch him you know do all these things and show me how to be passionate show mm-hmm. me how to be disciplined mm-hmm. you know so that when he gets to that age where he wants to pursue stuff that he has a role model that showed him how to do it and also be great at relationships mm-hmm. and also be working on being a better father being a better husband being a better friend mm-hmm. and so I think that's what I'm what I am unlearning Unlearning. again, all part of the journey. Thank you, Martin. I really appreciate that. Now, just to finalize, where do people can find you on the net? So probably the easiest place to find me is Instagram at Barton guy, Brian, or my podcast, the mindset forge podcast. And if you put in mindset forge, F O R G E in any of the podcast apps, my podcast will pop up. So that's one easy way to find me. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm on Instagram a lot. I post a lot of like videos about like mobility and warming nice. up and, and fitness stuff. I also obviously post about my podcast and mm-hmm. my guests. And I really, I really try to celebrate my guests because I'm, I try to pick people that I'm really inspired by and that their stories are really inspiring to me and I think to other people. And so I really like to highlight them and who they are and why people should care because I think, uh, Oftentimes, podcasts seem to be about the host, and I really believe that the, the host is the vehicle for sharing these people with the sure. world, and so that's my goal. Thank you. In closing, if you could leave the audience, Barton, with one question to expand their minds, what would that question be? In the quiet moment that you're sitting there alone and you're asking yourself, what? What do I want to do in my life that if I did it, I would absolutely feel fulfilled? Ask yourself that question and then go on a journey to find out what that is and go all the way. And I don't care what that looks like in terms of like society's version of success or not. If you want something and you go after it and you go all the way, then that is absolutely the only thing that matters. So that's my ask of people is, is remember who, what they are, what makes them tick, what they want, mm. and then set out to learn it and set out to do it and, and just do it at, at the highest level that you possibly can. And I promise you the rest of your life will probably start to evolve in the mm. same way with purpose and passion and, and positivity and the things that we see in people that are very purpose-driven. Thank you, Barton. Thank you. I really, really appreciate it. I really appreciate your hospitality, your insights in this conversation. Is there anything else that you would like to say before we close this episode for the next one, until the next one? Well, I just want to honor you that, uh, you you know, you're on this journey with me as podcasters and, and just clearly so excited about this opportunity to be a podcaster and to share people's stories and so i just applaud you for for you know just riding this wave you know just like all there's so many podcasters out there just trying to see what they can do and find you know find out where this journey takes you and so Mm -hmm. i just want to honor you for that and and encourage all your fans all the people (laughs) that are listening to not just you know follow him like his stuff but share it like this 
the only way this works is if more and more people really get to connect and get inspired by the stories. So don't just be a passive fan. Don't just sit there and say, hey, I like his stuff. I'm going to listen to a next episode. Like take that next leap and just share something that he's done that you really passionate about with other people. And that really is the best way to help JJ kind of further his mission. Thank you. I really, really appreciate that part. And uh, like you, like you said, even let's let's go to visit and listen the episodes of the Mindset Forge from where I have learned a lot. So I have to thank you for that. So thank you, guys. Uh, this was the interview with Barton Bryan here in Austin, Texas. If you guys like this this interview, thumbs up here down there subscribe to the channel to request more interviews and for sure we're coming with uh, the next three or four ones that are going to be as deep as these ones so that was all for today and i'll see you soon thank you guys